groups now with uh, certain things. It's Tuesday. I'm coming, uh, Craig Martell, coming to you live from the subarctic where it's very, very light. And what a beautiful day out. And today we have John Truby. What What about you, John? Where are you to come in us, uh, coming to us from? Coming from Los Angeles. Uh, and it's as beautiful as ever here. Uh, but, you know, not that we get outside very much these days, but... Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a lovely day, and I am super excited to be here with you. Oh, thanks! I really appreciate you coming on the show, <clears throat> and uh, and talking to our good people in Twenty Books to Fifty K. Uh, we're here live, and it streams over to Twenty Books to Fifty K that group, and that's where we uh, uh, are live. And then uh, we'll cut it over to YouTube later. But initially, it's all uh, Twenty Books to Fifty K, an exclusive with John Truby. <clears throat> It looks like, hey, thanks, Anne, for letting us know you're there, which means we're live. Only once did we start uh, a show, and there were no comments. And I said, hey, is anybody on? And uh, we checked Facebook, and there was nothing. Uh, uh, Be Live said we were live, but we weren't live. So we killed it. We started over, and then people popped up. Hey, where were you? Hey, we, we were here. Where were you? So uh, yeah. uh, we don't have that today. But what we do have is story. And as I always tell people, I think every human being is a natural storyteller. You grow up that way. But when you put it in writing, it changes. And now you have to get more uh, dynamic. You have to get better at crafting those words as opposed to just telling a story. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about what got you into the anatomy of story? You wrote what is, is considered the Bible. So what made you want to write that book? Well, you know, Craig, it, it happened so long ago that, that uh, few people remember <laughs> the origin. But, but when I started, there were no books really um, on, yeah, you, you know, you had Aristotle Poetics, but that's very theoretical and philosophical. And it's really not useful in terms of, of specific practical techniques for how you would go about crafting a story. Now, Originally, I was interested in writing for the screen, and there was really nothing about that. Um, and so I started developing my own story theory and story techniques, mostly as a way to help me mm -hmm. so I could master the craft, because it was going to be totally self-taught. Yeah. And what that meant was that the the... The disadvantage was, of course, that I'm um, making tons of errors, uh, <coughs> many mistakes, and it really took me years to develop the techniques. The benefit was that because I didn't have other systems or models to go on, um, I was able to come up with something that that I felt was was original, but more importantly, was organic to the story. And th this really goes back to the big complaint that I've had about about the 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 story structure techniques that are usually talked about and 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 that most indie novelists use to actually write their stories, which are it really boils down to two. Uh, we're talking three act structure, and we're talking hero's journey. And I just felt from the very beginning, I said, "There's something wrong here." This. This, you know, this is I I can craft a story that you know uh, the three act structure gives me a Jack and Jill story. Jack and Jill go up the hill, fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down, broke his crown. Jill came tumbling after. Three acts, complete story. But I felt that if you were going to write something that is more advanced and frankly more professional than Jack and Jill you need to go way beyond that. The craft of story is way more complicated than what is, is really encapsulated in either three act or hero's journey. And so what I tried to do is develop a, a set of techniques for story that are based on the development of the hero through the plot. And unlike three act, which is really a, a, a mechanical system that's applied from the outside, in other words, there are no actual acts in a story. There's no act breaks in a story. It's a free flow process that goes from beginning to end. And so my sense is 
what, what, what a great story is really about is the development of the hero that is accomplished and only accomplished through the plot events. And so what we're trying to do, the, in, in, in my opinion, the <coughs> most important story technique there is, is that plot must come from character. And that means a lot of things, but, but what it mostly, most importantly means is that the, the plot is the vehicle by which we are going to unfold that character and have them change and, and, and come to a, a better place by the end of the story that the, that the reader really cares about because they care about this person. So that in a nutshell is kind of what was behind how I started. And, you know, the, the, the basic idea I thought was that if, if I try to, to create techniques for how a great story works, it'll help me to be able to try to do that. And so that was my original motivation. That's, that's a, it's, it's the standard learning cycle of see, do, teach. You yep. saw it. You said, "Hey, I'm I'm writing. I'm doing. Oh man, I I'm missing some things." And I, I'll tell you, that's one of the main reasons I wrote the nonfiction books I did yep. was to better embrace release strategies and pricing strategies and those things I was doing and add more depth to them and give them meaning to help me moving forward as well. So yeah. yes, I, I I concur completely. I think that's a great uh, idea to start writing. But also, I need to highlight that on the run up to the Oscars. On your personal Facebook page, you were doing a countdown on your top ten, and and right. those, and I'm like, okay, now now 1917 is ruined for me because of uh, <laughs> of, of, of your comments. I mean, we're getting it. We we get it on uh, DVD. We can't stream where we are, so we right. we put the DVD into our uh, Netflix disc queue to yeah. get it, and I, I look forward to watching it because I think the visuality, especially being a retired Marine. The visuality of combat scenes like that I, I will will speak to me. But your recommendation for number one actually got it. Yeah, yeah, and, and I gotta tell you, Craig, that it, that doesn't always happen. No, um, no. You, usually, <laughs> in my opinion, they usually get it wrong. But this time, and and this was historical for a lot of reasons. But but the but the uh, not only did they get it right, but that it was the first foreign film to win Best Oscar. I mean, it is, and it's from South Korea. This is unreal. Uh, you know, I, I was I, I was over the moon by that. Not to mention the fact I was happy that I actually predicted. <laughs> but, but you <laughs> called it. You called it based on the story. You yeah. analyzed the story completely and said, "This is why it should win." Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I, I, you know, that it's it's always fascinating to me. I do this Oscar run up every year, and it, it, it partly I do it because I want to, in a thumbnail, try to impart some information about story that that people can immediately grasp because they've seen that movie. But, but part of it is also that I always like to, you know, obviously it's subjective, but I always like to take movies that everybody say is so fabulous and say, hey, guys, the emperor has no clothes here. You know, there's all kinds of problems here. Um, and and what, what's really funny is that people really get excited one way or the other. They, you know, if, if, if I trash their favorite film, they hammer me on. They hammer me on Facebook like you won't believe. They really get upset about it. But but that part of the thing is, I want to generate that kind of conversation about story. Yeah. Well, and that's. Uh, I'm glad you aren't analyzing any of the Star Wars movies. Those uh, that that wouldn't turn out well for anybody. No. Uh, so, but but those are. Uh, but understanding the story and the tendrils. Last year in Vegas. You talked about subplots and the minimum number of subplots and, and story tendrils that move the plot forward needs to be 12. You said some of the the biggest selling movies had like 24, had just a, a significant amount of subplots. Well, what, what I was referring to there was the, the element of reveals. Um, because it, as you know, in, in Vegas, I was talking about the importance of plot for indie, indie writers. Because when you're writing not just one novel, but multiple novels in a series, it puts incredible pressure on the plot. 
And this is what you have to create to sustain an entire series and get the read through that you need to get to build your readership. And so what I was talking about plot there, the problem is that in my experience, I've been doing this for 35 years, in my experience, by far, the biggest problem that writers have in trying to get to the professional level and trying to become successful professionals is the, the level of plot in their story. And that plot is what really differentiates the, the top professionals from everybody else, including all of the amateurs that are trying to write. Now, you know, as I say, the, the plot requirements for a novel series are unmatched by any other medium or story form in the world. That's how intense the plot requirement has to be. And I was trying to point that out is to say, look, these, these normal techniques for plot that you, you, you probably, most of you are probably using are not nearly sufficient for that task because it's so, such a huge task. And it's gotta be a plot that not only extends over multiple series, in other words, it has to be a long plot, it also has to have tremendous narrative drive. And that in popular storytelling, whether it be in novels, movies, television, narrative drive is what everybody is looking for. This is, this is in other words, it's what makes a page turner. It's, yeah. it, so it's not just plot, it's exciting plot. And it is, yeah. Is nonstop exciting plot, and that is really hard to do. Um, and so, what I was trying to get into were some of the techniques that go into a plot that can sustain that long and be that exciting for that long. So, long answer to your initial question: What I was talking about were that the really plot comes from two major elements. One is conflict, and the other is reveals. And you really have to match these up. You have to connect them. And you, you and really a, a, a good plot is going to kind of be a piggyback effect of conflict reveal, conflict reveal, and so on. Because what you're really talking about with conflict and reveal is action and learning. And that's how every story moves. The character takes action. They learn a new piece of information. That turns them on a different course of action. So we have a plot turn, and then they take more action, which, which is an action that is in conflict with the opponent that creates a new reveal and so on and so forth. So this is what I was talking about, about, about these, these a, a, a really good film will have, I mean, well, let me back up a little bit. The, the, the common notion in, in, in the old screenwriting classes was that you need three plot points for a movie to be successful. And this is complete nonsense. Uh, to, to really, and, and as we are saying is a really good film will have anywhere from 10 to 15 of these major plot points, which are in fact reveals. These are aha moments where the, the character says, oh, I thought it was this, but it's really that. And usually these reveals have to do with the actions of the opponent. I thought my opponent was taking this set of actions, had this plan to defeat me. I now find out that he's been deceptive and he's actually doing that. And the more you can, the more you can sequence into the story, the better the story will be, the better the plot will be. So that's really what I was what I was driving at. The, again, a long answer to your question, but the, yeah. the, that part of the problem with plot is that it's the reason people have so much trouble with it because they think of plot as these individual plot beats, and in fact, you, that will not work. Yeah. You have to think of plot as an overall strategy with a sequence of tricks that the opponent is using to defeat the hero. And unless you think of it with that big picture idea, this big picture strategy, um, you cannot string together the plot beats that you need to string together. And <clears throat> so I'm always trying to get people 
when they're talking about plot to go from the scene or the small picture to the big picture. And it, it, it's it, it's interesting with your with your marine background. Um, one of the things that informed my original story theory was my military background um, and my sports background. Um, my 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 military background is not. I was not personally. I did not personally serve, but my father was a career army officer, and we had many, many conversations about military strategy. He taught military strategy at the Army War College. And so a lot of my thinking about story was originally created by these different concepts of military strategy. And the this idea of grand strategy that both the hero and the opponent have. And, you know, uh, the... the one of the things, as you know, I, when we were talking in Vegas, I said, I, I really would love to have a sit down with you and talk about how that has affected your writing. Because, it, you, you know, I know that you're an extremely successful novelist and you and and you work in, I believe, in the space uh, war, space war, that combination of genre. And so I'm curious as to how you use these concepts of strategy, which I'm sure you're quite well versed in, in terms of how you write your stories and how you create your plot. I, I, I would say it has significant influence, uh, needless to say. And a lot of my military experience for my dialogue, it's mm. uh, these are usually just snippets of real dialogue while we were in the middle of, uh, of something horrible. And uh, it was some of the funniest things I, I, I ever remember because when the chips are down, you think you're going to die. That's when people are at their funniest because yeah. they're trying to uh, make it through the, the moment and through the day. Yeah. <clears throat> but the the strategy, I like uh, I like what I learned in fourth grade English with the five paragraph approach to writing. The first paragraph, tell them what you're going to tell them. The next yeah. three paragraphs, you tell them those things, and the last paragraph, you tell them what you told them. Yeah. So. The first one, and that's what I try to put in the first paragraph, uh, Charles Dickens, who published A Tale of Two Cities independently, one of the first indies, mm -hmm. uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And then he goes into these contrasts for the rest of that paragraph, which is like one sentence, the whole paragraph. But that's the whole book is about these contrasts. Yeah. And so he tells them exactly, it's very catching. And I use it as the primary example of setting up a story and then he uses irony, the reveals of, of the irony throughout. And uh, <clears throat> it, it, it's a, uh, I know it was panned at the time by the professional publishing houses, but it has stood the test of time. And it is a fantastic novel, especially to show you how many different, completely different stories yeah. you can put in one story. Yeah. So, so yes, you, you plan it out and it's nice to have the strategy. And one of the big things that I think is so important is the first page. And you do that in your, your story rescue worksheet. Let's see if I can get it centered there. Yeah. And hopefully people have downloaded it on the uh, link today. I put the link to that. Go jump on John Truby's uh, website and, uh, and download that, print it, take a look. And the, the, one of the things Don, John says right up front is, uh, your hero is an underdog who must overcome extreme odds. These yeah. kinds of things need to be on the first, in my mind, on the first page, give your hero a specific goal. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And then here's this person. Now you're introduced to the person. Yeah. And now what are they going to do? So you set that up and you keep the people turning the page because you're, you're flowing through this, telling them what all that is all about. Yeah. Yeah, but the, I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. You're, you're so right. I mean that that first page, that first paragraph is absolutely essential. I always tell people that ideally the entire book is in the first paragraph in microcosm, and that you know that can mean a lot of things, of course. But the point is, and 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 uh, I've even heard the argument that the you want to give a sense of the entire story in the first sentence. Uh, that's very hard to get away to get away with, but 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 it gives you the idea that 
these stories are, you know, they, they are a complete unit that is that is developing from beginning to end. And I, I talk in my, my book about the seven steps of great structure. And the, the, the first one is you set up the weakness of the character. And that's what's really being solved in the story. Most authors and readers think that it's about the second step, which is the desire, the goal. And desire is super important because that's what you hang the entire book on. But this weakness is the first thing that you set up, that flaw, the great flaw of the character, is what must be solved by the hero going after that goal. And so at the end, while usually the character accomplishes the goal, you can have many successful stories where the hero actually fails to reach the goal they've 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 that's the vehicle they've been tracking all along and that's what the audience thinks that oh this this is all about we get to the end and a lot of times the the uh main character discovers hey i didn't really want this after all or this is not the most important thing in my life and and so what they've learned in the self-revelation step which is the the second of the last step what they learn is how to solve that need, how, how to solve that weakness that they started with. And one of the things that makes stories so tricky is that you have the track that the audience and the reader and, and the writer thinks that the story is about, that's tracking that desire and absolutely everything hangs on it. But if you have not set up that weakness at the beginning, then it's not a personal story. It's a success story, but it's not a personal story because we haven't seen the hero grow by the end. And so these are all things that have to be set up right at the very beginning. And this is one reason why the setup of the story is by far the most difficult part of any story. And and the, de the personal development, that is, I think, one of the reasons that young adult has taken off. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hunger Games, uh, Harry Potter, Twilight, all of those are about the growth of the characters and, and what they accomplish. I mean, killing Voldemort, that's great, cool, but no, it was how are they going to, this orphan child, is he really the chosen one? Because they make fun of him during the, all seven movies for being the chosen one. Yeah. And, and it, it is such, it is so engaging that you got to learn and, and more and more reveals as you go on. I mean, uh, the first book was what, 70,000 words, and the last book was a quarter of a million. <laughs> like a, a good effort, a good effort uh, tying those plot points together. Yeah. But uh, but setting it up right away. I, I am also a fan of, needless to say, I grew up in the right generation where I watched all the James Bond movies. And you have James Bond, which doesn't follow your, your screenwriting technique in that that whole first scene is just James Bond doing something cool and yeah. explosions, and you find out in the second scene, here's what his real mission is. Yeah. But the what the first scene does is it promises that you're going to get action. Yeah. And I, I have to say that I haven't read the books. I don't know if Ian Fleming actually set things up that way, but uh, well, that's, I think they, that, yeah. that, that's a real interesting example that you're talking about because you're talking about, um, I, I do a lot of work on genres um, and talking about I have a number of classes in, in each of the major genres. And there's 14 major genres from which all almost all storytelling worldwide is done. And then, of course, we have a massive number of subgenres in each of these forms. But when you're talking about James Bond, you're talking about the action and myth forms. And James Bond is the most popular superhero of the 20th century. And one of the things about superheroes is that they don't change. They are, and there are not many genres w that come into conflict with this idea of the change of the hero, but action is one of them. And, and we're talking here about the traditional action story, but, but James Bond is this figure who, um, you know, he, he is this incredible secret agent. He's also the greatest ladies man in the world. 
right? So, and so typically what you have, in, not only in James Bond, but in any classic action story, in the opening scene, we're not, we don't give them the goal. We, we do what I call an overture scene. It's a microcosm scene. This is an action hero. And it's exactly what you just said, which is we have to establish for the reader right away, this is somebody who does action and they're really good at it. They're the best action person in the world, you know? And so we set up basically their brand with that. And then we get into the specifics of that particular story. Now, part of this thing about a character who doesn't change is one of the things that you often see in stories with, with series. In other words, where we have, and this goes all the way back to ancient Greece, where you had superheroes like Theseus and Perseus and Hercules. These characters have different adventures. And those are similar to each has it, each adventure is their own book. And so the whole point was don't have them change because we want the audience to come back to this character, the reader to come back to this character every time and know, yeah, that's Hercules. That's my guy. You know, he, he doesn't do this change. Now, having said that, one of the most interesting techniques that we have seen is in the James Bond series. And it's funny, I, I had a sit down with the writer of the uh, Casino Royale, when they redid Casino Royale, which is Casino Royale is the origin film of James Bond. And what happened was what the traditional concept about the action story and James Bond was, this is a character who doesn't change. They don't have flaws. They are, you know, th their job is to make things right in the world and, and stop people from taking over the world. Fine. Well, what had happened with the James Bond series is we'd had, I don't know, 25 films and it had gotten really stale. And it was basically a series of stunts. Every movie was a series of stunts. And the question was, are the stunts in this movie better than that, the previous movie? Okay. So there was no story in it. And so what the writer, the main thing that the writer did was, is he gave James Bond a flaw, both a psychological and a moral weakness. This is unheard of. You just, conventionalism says you cannot do that. The audience doesn't want to see that from an action hero. They won't go to it. And in fact, just the reverse happened. And what, they, what the writer did was he took James Bond's strength and his claim to fame. He's the greatest ladies man in history. And it made it his flaw. It's because being a ladies' man got a woman killed. And, and then, of course, over the course of the story, James Bond falls in love. James Bond can't fall in love. The, the ladies' man doesn't do that. What are you, are you out of your mind? But what the, by showing this weakness and then showing character change on the part of James Bond, first ever in a James Bond movie, that thing went through the roof. And they found out that the conventional wisdom that says you can't have an action hero change was wrong. And yeah. that, in fact, and what you get, the beauty of it is you get a double success at the end. Not only does James Bond succeed in the action line, which he always succeeds in, but he succeeds in the personal line, even though it ends with tragedy because his, the woman he falls in love with dies but he deals with that psychological and moral flaw that he had uh, and, and, you know, and that he was most famous for. So it, 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 these are all just great techniques of taking the basic step of story and flipping them, twisting them in unique ways is what I always talk about in genres, is the trick is not just to hit the beats of the genre, that you have to do, otherwise you're not doing the form, and then your reader doesn't want to doesn't want to read it. You know why do you why do you think they come to an action book every you know time and time again? It's because they love the form. So you got to hit the beats. But if you don't do the beats in a unique way, then you're doing what everybody else is doing. You're not original. And then why does anybody want to come to your brand? Yeah, Casino Royale was a seminal change in the brand. Yeah. And then at the end, you find out that 
the only reason he was let go from that chair scene, which was uh, uh, made, made me wince, was uh, because of the woman that he fell in love with. Now, he did not get himself out, which usually, yeah, they've got the uh, the yep. sawmill and he's he's going towards it and something yep. happens. Okay, yep. But this one, he, he was not getting out of that, but for what he would always dominate was the women. Yeah. And so, uh, yes, that big twist at the end. I mean, it was a, it was a great movie from that regard. Let's look at a different genre, a science fiction. Uh, yeah. Star Trek, the original series, was one of my favorites. DC Fontana yeah. and Gene Roddenberry wrote incredibly powerful stories that uh, touched on the social issues of the day, but made it fun and easy to watch. And uh, it was initially called Wagon Train to the Stars. Yeah. So it was Westerns moving uh, in, into space. Yeah. So I write science fiction. I read a lot of Westerns. Yeah. I also follow uh, a, a Western author named, uh, last name Haas. He wrote a letter to his son on, you've got to maintain my legacy. Here's how I write my stories. Mm-hmm. And, and that whole outline you you look like you've seen it. I I love that because it's it was written I think on a typewriter. He jammed it. It was it was uh, uh it it was original in probably the nineteen seventies. Right. And, and seeing that is like yes, that is a plot that works. And then he threw in here's how I twist it. It's got to be it's got to be the same, but it's got to be original. Right. Exactly. It's got to be the same, but it's got to be original. That pretty much says it in a nutshell in terms of popular storytelling to date in every medium in the world, right there. It's got to be the same, but it's got to be original. And if you don't have them both, you're dead. <laughs> you're you're going to have a hard time selling the second book. Uh, yeah. You may sell the first book through great marketing, but then the sec- nobody's going to buy the second one because they didn't like the first one. And this is, you talked originally about read through. If you want the read through of a series, every book needs to have that and deliver. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's why to me, it's so important that you structure out not just the individual book, but the entire series to speak again. It's all part of that master plan, that master strategy that you have to, in this particular case, to carry the reader through each book and hooking one book to the next to get that read through. Because as you know, economically, if you don't get that read through, you're going to lose money. And, yeah. and and whereas the the opposite is the case, if you can get read through, not only are you going to make money, you're going to make a lot of money. This is the real trick to, to being successful as an indie novelist. And the, the point that I always try to make and, you know, in our, in, the classes that I did in, in Vegas back in November was that the real trick to read through is a master plot with narrative drive that can extend over multiple books. And I, I then just tried to get into a number of techniques for how you can do that. But but to me, in, until you accept that as the basic business fact of life for indie writing, um, then you're you're dead in the water. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have significant challenges, and and I've seen a lot of stories, some of mine included, that that suffer from this because of the intentionality that must go into uh, designing your story. We have a question from Heather Davis: When setting up the nemesis, do we create flaws and growth in the similar way? Absolutely, that's a great question and so important. One of the biggest problems in storytelling and it's very common for amateurs, is that they make the opponent, the antagonist, just bad. He's evil. He's a villain. And now there is an advantage there in the sense that the audience knows, the reader knows, this guy is the main opponent. And that focuses the conflict. But if you can also provide at least one serious psychological and moral flaw to that character, you make them human. And I I believe that no matter what the genre is, including action, no matter what the genre, the more human, the more flawed you can make the opponent and the hero, the better the story will be, because then you're going to get that double track again. You're going to get the surface track, which is, 
who is going to win the goal, the hero, the opponent. But then you're going to get that deeper track, which is this track about becoming a better human being. And, you know, an example I often give is in one of the Raiders of the Last Ark movies. Um, I think it's the, the second one uh, where the the opponent is a is a guy who reaches into people's chests and rips their heart out and eats it. I said, this guy is not going to have a self-revelation. He's not going to learn anything at the end. So it means you have a one note opposition with that character. It also limits how, wanna, wanna say it limits the ability of that character to create plot. Because, and, and this is one of the, the real secrets of story, which is the key to setting up plot is the opponent, not the hero. The hero plays out the plot, but the opponent is what creates it. And that's why I always tell writers, that when, when you're trying to figure out your plot, the first thing you want to do is go to the opponent, put yourself in his head, and figure out what plan is he going to come up with to defeat the hero and get the goal for himself. And so the more, the deeper, the more layered you can make this opponent, not only does it make them a more human and therefore a more interesting character to read, it also makes their ability to plot, interestingly enough, greater. And the more, the more the opponent and hero have in terms of the ability to plot, the better the story will be. Yeah, the uh, and and uh, the the double twist yeah. where the character is is going against this uh, enemy, and also keep in mind, no bad guy thinks he's the bad guy. He right. thinks the good guy's the bad guy. So, uh, from a, uh, a a perspective. Keep that in mind, and as you go through the story, then you know they have their conflict. It uh, they keep moving forward, and then he defeats the bad guy, and then finds out the bad guy. he was only a henchman, and now you've got a new bad guy who's bigger, greater, and so it gives you a a a more robust story. That's a Louis L'Amour technique where yeah. it's uh, I think the uh, what do you call it the double blind or something like that. I, it was double something, and uh, it was. Hey, all this, you set up this whole convo, all of a sudden, oh my God, that's only halfway there. Yep. And that halfway up the mountain, I know in the Marine Corps, when we did uh, uh, formation runs, the kiss of death was where you would end where you normally end and they take a turn and just keep going. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, it was soul crushing because uh -huh. you're, you're almost dying and then, and then they take a veer off and you find you can make it, but it, it, it gets you back into what you're doing. And so that, 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 that's just a great point, Craig. And I, and I want to emphasize that we were talking earlier about the reveals. That's one of the best reveals you can have in a story, which is, and, and it, it's actually definitely a beat that, that, that you're, that you're mentioning here. We also see that technique in the Godfather, whereas you, you have a character that the reader thinks is the main opponent for probably two thirds of the story. And then about two thirds of the way in, Sometimes later, you will get a reveal. The hero will get a reveal that that is definitely an opponent, but he's not my main opponent. My real opponent is, you know, in, in The Godfather, it's I thought it was Salazzo who's been trying to kill my dad, but I find out it's Barzini all along. <laughs> Barzini is Salazzo's boss. And this, you get a reveal like that in your story, it's worth bags of gold. It's fantastic. We have a question up on the screen. Uh, how detailed does a series plan need to be before you begin writing? How macro to micro? I am a big believer in having a detailed macro and micro plan. And I liken it to if you were writing a television series. And TV series in the last 20 years or so have become the best stories in the world. And they're based on exactly the same series that we do in indie novels, which, and all of them, of course, are based on Dickens. He's the guy, he's the reason we're all here. You know? And that, that's how important this guy is. Um, but the, the requirements, the plot requirements to write a series are immense. And in my opinion, and because plot is so based on this master strategy, 
primarily de- created by the opponent, but also by the hero. You need to put, you need to make that very detailed. And in my opinion, you need to put it up on the wall. Now, in, for example, in a TV writer's room where they have to write these series really fast and keep, and, the, and at the same time, the quality has to be really, really high. Um, y- you go into a writer's room, every wall is covered with cards. And those cards are, you know, one row of cards, one column of cards will be episode one, then episode two. And they'll track the cards vertically to see how that particular episode works. And they'll track it horizontally to see how the episodes build to create a season. Because one of the the keys to when, when television went to series television as opposed to single episodic television, which is, had been the primary way it was done. What happened was that the, the measure of success went from the single episode to the season. And that's why TV series like Game of Thrones are so fantastic. It's not just, boy, that was a great episode. It's because the whole season, the whole series, sequence of episodes was fantastic ending with that big blowout final episode of the season. Well, a a, a series in an indie novel has to do exactly the same thing. And an argument can be made that that the threads, the plot sequencing that has to go on for multiple characters in an indie novel series is even more complex than it is for a TV series. And that's saying something when you got things like Game of Thrones, which has you know over a hundred major characters. But yeah. but that's but that's the task that you are dealing with, and that's why I say we not only want to see the overall sequencing of your series mapped out, we want to see it quite detailed for each for each individual novel, so that that works structurally and it also builds structurally to the next one. And when you sequence them all together, the entire series just blows people's mind. That's what you're really going for. You want to think series, not individual novel. And, and still, on, on one thing uh, that uh, I, I'd say I write escape fiction, I need to leave people feeling happy at the end. So mm-hmm. that subplot, that one, the story plot needs to be resolved at the end and, and people win, whatever that win looks like. And then, and then a setup for the next book without being a cliffhanger. I'm not a fan of cliffhangers, and neither are my fans. It, it uh, turns out. Yeah. But that we we have a, we have a different question uh, from Hal. Are any of the rules different or flipped on their head for comedy? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I do a I do a whole comedy class. Uh, one of my favorites, you know, because all the the clips are are all fabulous. But but. Comedy hits all of the same techniques as serious fiction, all the same techniques. And, and yet they are fundamentally opposed to each other. They are fundamentally different. And l- let me give you just a, 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 a few examples of that. In, in serious fiction, we tend to have, in terms of the character, the individual character, we tend to have a character who has a slow decline and then rise at the end of the story when he learns what he needs to learn, when he has his self-revelation. Comedy, on the other hand, drops characters immediately, time and time again. So we basically set them up, we drop the character, set them up, drop them. And every time we drop a character, that's a joke, that's a laugh. All right, so we're, it, it, the way that the, the, the character is dealt with is fundamentally different in common. Um, the, the, another tr- really tricky thing about comedy is the subgenres are so different from each other. So when people ask me, well, how, you know, what are the beats for comedy? I always say, well, what kind of comedy are you talking about? Because you've got farce, You've got black comedy, you've got romantic comedy, action comedy, uh, romantic comedy. I, I'm not sure I've already said that, but um, you've got satire, parody. These, these have very different beats, one from the other. And that's why 
knowing the beats of your genre or your subgenre are so important. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> the genre of romance. We talk about uh, romance, romance uh, owning what 60%, 65% yeah. of the all the all the books that are read. The uh, it, it's always the HEA, the happy ever after ending. Yeah. And they start with the conflict. So what kind of advice would you give a romance author on making that engaging setup to begin with for a powerful story? Well, it, it, romance is very tricky. I tell people in my anatomy of story class that romance is probably the most difficult genre there is. And it always surprises people. And of course, the people who are writing romance, you know, they, they, they're they're quite unhappy to hear that, right? That just what just what they didn't want to hear is that I'm, I am writing the most difficult genre there is to write. But there's a few structural reasons for it, a few story reasons for it. One is that, and probably the most basic one, is that you're talking about two people falling in love. The last two people who are going to get into conflict are two people who are falling in love. Now, this is why one of the first beats in the setup of a romance is known as the meet cute. And basically what it is, is it's, it's a serendipitous way that they, that they meet each other. And the reason for it is that we want the reader to think, that these two people were fated to be together. This isn't just any two people. The universe is involved in this romance, right? That's how important and how great this romance is going to be. And the way we do that is we create this serendipitous meeting of, that, that's usually funny, but it also usually involves some kind of conflict, some kind of initial fight. And I always ask, uh, the the writers they say, well, when when the two of them first meet and they get into a fight, who wins the fight? And some people say the guy, some people say the woman, and so on. No, the answer is it's a tie. And the reason it's a tie is because they are showing the reader that these two people are right for each other. They're totally equal, right? And but but one of the reasons that this me cute has this conflict in it. And you think about it realistically, this makes no sense. This makes zero sense, right? I see somebody that I think is very attractive and I want to meet that person. So I go up to her. The first thing I decide to do is get into a fight with her. Now, how stupid is that, right? It just makes no sense. But there is a story structure reason for it that you know you have to begin with conflict and you have to do a setup that forces them to stay in conflict with a good part of the story. Now, this is one of the reasons it's so hard because why would two people falling in love be in constant conflict throughout? And that's why you have to, you have to based on their job. Uh, based on a different set of values that they seem to have, that are in conflict with one another. Um, anything that cre can create this somewhat believable conflict. I mean, nobody really believes it. It's one of the conventions that when we read romance, we realize that's part of the convention, you know, so we can have a story that lasts more than 10 pages. You know, it, it, but, but they, but people buy into it, but you, you still, you have to do. It. And so this is why over the course of the story, as they get to know each other, the things that they fight about get deeper. In other words, initially, they typically are conflicts about personality. But as we move into the story, they become conflicts about character and they become conflicts about power and control because each tries in their own way to control, to gain power in the relationship. And what they both have to learn is that it is not about winning a power game. 
right? If one of us wins and the other loses, we've both lost. It's about understanding that we're together, we're a team, that we each help each other, that we are each our best selves because the other is with us. And so that's why the conflict has to deepen in terms of what it's really about with the character, personality being somewhat superficial um, and character being quite deep. In, in uh, romance as a subgenre or as a as a as a element within a good story, romance and humor. Yeah. I know in my science fiction, I always have <clears throat> some romantic elements flowing through it, and I always have humor. <clears throat> and I know those are those are very, very well received by the readership. I think those are one of the things that that stand books apart. <clears throat> the uh, including romance as a an element within your story, as well as humor, what would you recommend for somebody who thinks they're bad at it, bad at writing the romance trope as it may be? You, you, you're not bad at it. Um, I, I say the same thing. People say, you know, I'm really bad at dialogue. I don't have a good ear for dialogue. Well, if you're bad at dialogue, it's not because you got a bad ear. It's because you're forcing the dialogue to do what it doesn't do well. You're forcing it to carry the story. You get let the structure do carry the story, and then you layer dialogue on top of that, and then you're not forcing the characters to give all this information about what's happening in the story, exposition, and so on, it's bad dialogue. Same thing is true about romance. You're not bad at romance. You're only bad at romance if you don't know the beats of romance. And, and you know, sometimes I, I have a, a monthly writing workshop that I do, and the number of stories in there are romances. And what typically happens is we we do a beat sheet. We do a, a you know the sequence of structural scenes in the story, major structural beats. And what inevitably happens is that the writer will not have all the beats of a romance. And these are beats that have been carefully calibrated over decades, even centuries in terms of how do you build a romance through conflict? As I say, this is fundamentally a contradiction in terms. So if you don't know the beats of the romance and what you just set up, Craig, is combining it with another genre and making it the secondary genre to a main genre, that's even more complicated because then you gotta mix the beats. You gotta have the main, the beats of the main genre and you've got to have the, the romance beats, which is the secondary genre. So to me, the game is always won or lost in the structure. It's always won or lost in the genre beats, knowing what they are. And of course, if you don't know what they are in the first place, you can't twist them. So what I would strongly recommend is learn the romance beats. Once you know, that gives you the scaffolding that you can stand on. That gives you the confidence to do something special and know the story is still going to build the way it has to build to pay off. That's, that's great advice. Uh, Victorian, uh, Victorine Le, uh, Lieski has a book out on, on writing contemporary romance. I think that's a great book to set you up to, to help you understand. If you're not a romance writer, but you want to include a romance sub-element, uh, I'll tell you that some of my favorite movies, I find that I can watch them over and over and over again because they're always fresh. There's so much going on so fast. Uh, one is Midsummer Murders, uh, Ring Out Your Dead, where the bell bell ringers are. I can watch that all the time because it's just every scene is 30 seconds, no more, and they just jump throughout, and they're all moving forward at the same time. You see the, the camera pan, you see things. And, and one scene will be just a quick interchange between two characters and you laugh. It's like, ah, it was funny. And then they move on to something else. So great. Another one is Star Trek IV, hmm. uh, The Journey Home. And that one, at first I kicked myself because they asked for, I, I was in Monterey at the DLI at language school. I was a sergeant 
and they asked for extras. Hey, go down to the, the to the aquarium, and you can be an extra on this movie, Star Trek's film. And I'm like, oh, that would be cool. I got stuff to do. Uh, Marines don't do that. And uh, no, no kidding, uh, they actually filmed it. And now a chief that I knew, he's one of the ones. He's wearing his uniform, and he's there in the movie. But I think one of the things with that that movie that makes it so watchable is the other stuff. The I, I know uh, Leonard Des Moines was a big activist for uh, for uh, wildlife and for environment, and it, and it was it was part of the main plot. But on this one, it wasn't it wasn't preachy. It yeah. was just accepted because they still hey we have to fight this big thing in space, and I need whales. And they always made it. I, I need whales. And you're like, what? What the hell? Who, and they're like, okay, they, whales get killed, but we need to keep them because we got to go fight this thing in space. And I, I think that uh, really carried that movie because I can watch it. I can watch it once a month for Pete's sake. Yeah. No, it, that 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 is, in my opinion, one of the most important keys to great story, which is you have to have a strong theme. In in fact, the theme is probably the most underestimated element of story. People think, oh, well, I don't want, you know, if you want to send a message, go to Western Union. It's a famous line from, uh, uh, I, I can't remember, uh, a famous producer back in old, old days of Hollywood. But, and he's right. If, you see, if, if you're expressing the theme on the nose in an obvious way, in a preachy way, that's a kiss of death. Nobody wants to watch that. Yeah. But if you, if you express it through the story, and as you point out, we need whales to win the conflict, to beat the opponent. When you do it that way, then all of a sudden the defenses to the message go down and I'm wide open. And in fact, that makes me feel much better if I see a larger purpose to this conflict. Yeah. And so it, it's just absolutely essential. And it, it's, it's why I always emphasize in my, in my story class, that we need to express the theme gradually over the course of the story through the story structure beats. So as those structure beats build, we are carrying the theme little by little until we get to the final battle and the self-revelation, which is where the theme really expands in the mind of the audience. And, and But it's done in a, because it's been done in an organic way through conflict, it's like this fantastic, rush for the reader as they say yes this is this is what i really really want and then we get not only the success of the one character the hero we get the success of humanity of all of us together and that's a real big rush big <laughs> yeah big and the uh a question came to mind uh, and some, somebody popped up about uh, saggy middle uh, put a whale in it well we're not going to add whales to every story but saggy middle a lot of indies that I talk to seem to get lost somewhere about the middle of their story. And in the hero's journey, that's uh, as you're at the top of the mountain, uh, you know, Jack and Jill uh, got the water. Now yeah. what? Oh, we start to take a tumble. You have that change. But what uh, what advice would you have for the middle? And maybe what what problems do people create for themselves as they're writing and then get to the middle? Yeah, that is the $64 million question right there. It is the single biggest problem that writers in every medium, in every genre have. Um, and they don't know why they have the problem. Well, there's a lot of reasons for it. And, and in fact, I cover my, the, the, in my, my anatomy of story class. Um, I cover, I, I have four modules that are based just on this question. Because what you're really talking about is plot. What is really sagging is the plot. And it be, it's because the writer doesn't know how to set up a sequence of events that build together. So they've got an opening and so they think, oh, I'll have a really quick opening, big action opening. Okay, fine. And I know I've got my big closing, right? Well, how do I get from, from A to Z? Well, because, because they're thinking in terms of individual beats, individual moments, the opening, the closing, the climax, they don't realize that the game is won or lost in the sequencing of the events and the structure under the surface of those events. And that structure has got to be linked in a way that the reader does not see. 
but that you, the writer, knows what it is. And and there's there's a ton of things, techniques to to prevent the the soft middle or the sagging middle. But let me just tell you one of the most important. 99% of stories fail in the middle pages. 90%. Now, what writers do is they think, well, uh, that must be where my problems are. So I, they, they start looking at those middle pages and think, where, where's it going wrong? Where's it going wrong? No, no. It happened at the beginning. Yeah. It's how you set up the story in the first place. If you do not set up the story in such a way to create, first of all, a weakness and a major weakness on the part of the hero that will be solved and make it a personal story, and to a strong desire line that is very clear and we know the end point, then you don't have a spine that you can ride the story out with. And that spine is what you hang all those other events on. And the, the, another thing you, you have to do at the beginning in the setup is how you set up the opposition. And when we're talking about setting up those opposition, it's not just who is my main opponent, it's who are all those secondary opponents. And to touch on a, a technique we talked about earlier, do I have a, a parent opponent and a deeper opponent, a hidden opponent, who's the real opponent? These are all ways that that create this plot that builds in the middle, but it all has to be figured out and set up at the yeah. end. And if you don't get the opening right, nothing you do in the middle pages in terms of rewrites will make any difference at all. I look at plot and and the overall story as a string of pearls. Mm -hmm. You you put one on, you knot it so it doesn't fall off like uh, some of the shows show, and and then you add the next pearl. And if you have Tom Clancy style where he had three plots going simultaneously, yeah. well, that's simply a string of pearls where you have intertwined pearls yeah. starting and ending at the at the defined places. The <clears throat> The uh, the middle getting that set up for the the middle is simply just a conflict reveal conflict reveal yeah. and each conflict a, a small resolve and it builds overall tension and then it, you just keep moving forward the there should be no middle in a book it, it's it's those elements that get you to the end right. me personally I write the first chapter and I write the last chapter but then I change I'm, I'll change and update the last chapter based on how I got there yeah. depending on that stuff but each one you just put those you just string those pearls together and you get to the end i i think in scenes and i, I hate to admit it but i i never plot out a book and i can't say <laughs> never i i have the plots and the one i'm writing right now i actually have a very very extensive like a a ten thousand word outline wow. with all the background and world building and stuff like that mm -hmm. it's it's the final book in a 19 book series so this one really needed to be uh, rather rather robust I'm forty thousand words in, and uh, I feel like I'm I'm still at chapter one. So there's wow. a, there's so many scenes between here and there, and I ran it past my betas, and it's got enough movement. But that's uh, I I, I use my beta beta readers rather extensively to make mm -hmm. sure I'm just looking for. I can't wait to see what's next. That's what I want from them, yeah. wherever yeah. I send it. So uh, that's my check. We're at sixty three minutes. I see. So unfortunately, we're not able to take any more questions. Thank you, John, for coming on. I, I really, really appreciate that. Where can they? Where can our uh, our guests find you? Well, the, uh, the 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 best way is first of all, if you want to get that uh, that story rescue sheet, um, let me see. Let me. I've Somebody really... copied the link in already, so it's in the comments. Okay. So we're good. Okay, good. Yeah. Ruby.com forward slash worksheet. Um, and then the, the other place you can see all, all my work, all my classes and so on is at Truby.com. Um, I got, I've got the, the main classes as well as genre classes in all the major genres, uh, which also, which talks about all the beats in each of those genres and as well as the beats in all the subgenres. So it's quite extensive. And I think people will find it very, very useful as well as I have a number of breakdowns of uh, films, TV shows, and so on that people will recognize where I apply stru structure techniques 
to stories that people have actually seen. And I think it's very useful that way. Uh, Craig, it has been a great pleasure. Love talking with you about story and hope we can do it again sometime soon. Oh, you bet. And as uh, John and I were talking before we went live, uh, Vegas is on. I see no reason to uh, to cancel that uh, at this point, and I don't see it later. I think we're going to be okay uh, if we have a second wave. Hopefully, that'll be over, dealt with, and and figured out treatments and all that good stuff, so we can go to Vegas and finally get out of our houses. And hopefully, I sent a note to Vegas this morning asking them, "Will the Firelight Buffet be open?" I mean, I, I uh, it's it's kind of a selfish ask, but the Firelight Buffet is very important to me for those of you who have been to Samstown, but that's where John's gonna come talk to us. He has an hour and a half session, and I think you have an hour and 45 minute session. I gave you two sessions that were, one went through the break and one was a set because Mal Cooper uh, needed an hour and a half to tell us like seven hours worth of information. So uh, Mal, you uh, uh, are, we're actually, Gene Malika is gonna do how to do a photo shoot, and he has an, uh, he's on that same session where he's going to have live models set it up, do a, a real life photo shoot for people who are, are interested in that aspect of cover building. So, so much going on in Vegas. I already built the initial schedule and, uh, and we will we'll go from there. Thank you, John. I really appreciate your time. And tomorrow on the CNM show, it's Michael taking over. And I believe he's going to have Steve Campbell as, as his guest, not that Steve Campbell, the other Steve Campbell. And, uh, We'll see you then. Uh, check the event schedule for the time. And everybody, I think you have a great day. I think this was a great uh, a great interview, one worthy of watching multiple times probably because uh, John hit you with a lot of information quickly on a variety of topics. But all of it, you just take those lessons that, that uh, you can learn, apply them, and write a better story. Thank you very much, John. See you later. Thanks, Craig.